Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I'm going to be going through the 10 perfect prog albums of all time. Of course it's my opinion and I need to sort of um, at the beginning of the video set out what I mean by perfect. I'm not saying these are the greatest or the best or the most important. What is I'm saying is they're perfect. Now does perfect mean it's the best? Not necessarily. Right I'm going to be ranking these albums from um, 10 to 1. Uh, as well so at the end of this I will have the most perfect album ever made in the genre of progressive rock now of course this is absolutely ridiculous um, what do we mean by perfect well I sat down and thought how am I going to do this well there's some albums I absolutely love they're incredible albums but say the production's not that great or say there's one track that's a real stinker or say a lot of the tracks are really, really good, but there's a couple of tracks that are absolutely incredible. But on a whole, it's okay. And the incredible tracks elevate that album up for you because it makes it so brilliant. But it's not necessarily perfect. Then we have the artwork and then we have the concept behind it. There's all these things together. And there's th certain albums for me that I have always felt absolutely perfect in every way the sort of album that when you put them on you're going to listen to it from to beginning to end and not go oh i'm not so keen on this track now of course this is very subjective i think once we get into the realms of perfection because of course perfection doesn't really exist does it it's a thing that human beings have invented to uh, basically compare everything by so um this is a subjective list, but I thought it would be a bit of fun. And uh, you lot love a progressive rock list, don't you? So uh, let's have a go. So um, there's a few anomalies in, in, in this list for you. So um, I do apologise. I think there's definitely three that progressive rock fans might get up in arms at, especially as, as I'm saying these are perfect albums. But I do believe the albums that I'm going to list are all progressive rock, and I do think they're all perfect. Shall we kick off, shall we? So at number 10... I have one of the um, anomalies on my list. So at number 10, I have Romantic Warrior by Return to Forever. Return to Forever are really known as a jazz rock fusion band, but they were very influenced by progressive rock, um, especially bands like Yes. Uh, Stanley Clark had um, often described his um, uh, respect for Chris Squire from Yes. Um, Chick Corea right from the start was um mixing a sort of um sorry my light's gonna be over here the the, the uh chicory was always bringing classical influences and and um classical motifs and towards the mid 70s this starts to move towards an almost medieval motifs emerging um when they were signed to polydor records they made some incredible albums him to the seventh galaxy um where have I known you before these are absolute masterpieces of jazz rock and they're very proggy but for me those those Polydor albums suffer in the production realm um, in 1976 they moved over to Columbia Records CBS and they recorded Romantic Warrior Romantic Warrior is, is Return to Forever at their peak and what are Return to Forever? Well, musicianship-wise, there isn't another prog band to touch them, I'm afraid. These are jazz rock musicians, and I've always felt that jazz rock musicians have another level with the incredible Aldi Miola on guitar, basically laying an, a new standard for speed guitar playing that's going to be picked up from everybody, from Ingvi Malmsteen to Dream Theater. You know, he's got a certain sound, and it really comes to the fore on this album. You know, Chick Corea... The master of keyboards with about 10 synthesizers is such a wealth of sound. Lenny White's incredibly propulsive yet funky drumming and Stanley Clark's insane bass. And on this album, they push the prog intensity to the max. I've always felt that this is the greatest instrumental prog album of all time. And the production is absolutely beautiful. Um, if you want jaw-dropping musicianship, this is the album to go for. It's absolutely mind-blowing. And there's a sense of humour behind it as well. So often when they've just pulled off something absolutely insane technically, Chicory will bring in some like clown motif or sort of a sort of medieval jester motif that will come hopping in from out of nowhere and just puts a smile on your face. It's some incredible stuff. There's some beautiful stuff on here. And the title track, A Romantic Warrior, which is an acoustic piece 
for a guitar, acoustic guitar, piano, and double bass. It's absolutely beautiful. It's the sort of thing you never normally hear on a progressive rock album. So that's what I have at number 10 is Romantic Warrior by Return to Forever. Right, so hopefully those who are watching, I put a little bit of the cat amongst the pigeons. You know, I'm going to be missing out some of your favourite bands, I think, and you'll have to moan and tell me how useless I am as a YouTuber. You know nothing, Andy. How you shouldn't have the right to do this. If you don't include Gentle Giant, then it's not a worthy list. Do I include Gentle Giant? I haven't included Gentle Giant. One of my favourite prog bands, but they're not on the list. Some brilliant albums, but for me, perfect. In terms of the production, I'm not too sure. But um, at number nine, I do have, by King Crimson, the album Red. Now, King Crimson, a great case in point for the example of this. In the Court of the Crimson King, their debut album is a masterpiece. It's where they lay the groundwork for prog. And it's beautifully recorded, that album is. 21st Century Schizoid Man is a phenomenal track. In the Court of the Crimson King is a phenomenal track. But then when we get to tracks like Moonchild and a few other things, it, 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 the album lacks pace for me. It's a bit dreary. And they noodle a bit too much. Um, self, too much self-indulgence. I mean, they, they, they're 80% there on the album. And the 80% is incredible. Right? Um, so that is an incredible album and should be on the top 10 of any progressive rock you know, albums, great albums. You know, if I was doing the most 10 most important progressive rock albums, then, um, of course, that would be pretty near the top. Um, but when it comes to perfection, it's an interesting thing. My favourite incarnation of uh, King Crimson is the band with Bill Bruford, uh, Jamie Moore originally on percussion, Dave Cross on violin, John Wetton on bass, Robert Fripp on guitar. And they record a trio of albums plus a live album. Uh, um, in the um, early to mid 70s the first one being Locks, Tongues and Aspic the second one being Stars of the Bible Black uh, and then the final one being Red I am offering the album Red as a perfect album um, if I was to say what my favourite album is of those three it would be um, Locks, Tongues and Aspic All right? uh, Stars of the Bible Black is wild because it came, contains loads of live improvisation uh, Lots of Sin Aspect's got a much wider palette of styles that they go through, and some of that isn't quite successful. Also, the sound of their pioneering isn't quite developed. You know, that sort of heavy, dark, almost like, you know, heavy metal Black Sabbath sound appears on Lark Sons and Aspects in a couple of places. Um, but there's other stuff. And the other stuff's fantastic. Book of Saturday Exiles is all fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Talking Drum, it's all brilliant. But... For me, the album's not quite as a whole. It's it's a it's a fantastic list, but is it perfect? Right. Um. The the live album USA is great, but it's it's um mired by production for me. A lot of albums get you know they they will get down. They're brilliant albums, but if if they if the production's not quite there, and I think there was some overdubby on some of the live stuff as well. I think David Cross came in and stuff. So there's all these little niggles. These are niggles. I'm talking about some of the best albums ever made, but they're niggles, aren't they? So um. What do we have with um, Red? It's an incredible journey. Side One has three very, very concise King Crimson tunes. Um, and they all do different things. The title track, Red, is heavy and lumbering. It's the definition of King Crimson that time. Fallen Angel is a beautiful ballad. One More Red Nightmare just takes you to places. and It's got that Bill Bruford sound. That is three perfect tracks. Then you turn it over and you get an improvisation. You get the sort of improvisations that's in the Stars on Bible Black, but it's concise and controlled. And then it goes into one of the greatest progressive rock epics of all time called Starless, where they do everything King Crimson ever has ever done. It's an incredible thing. So that's what I've got at number nine is Red by King Crimson, a perfect album. Uh, at number eight, I've got a progressive rock band that I haven't championed enough on this channel, and I absolutely love them. And I think here I'm showing the love because I know that if I don't, this this band will get picked up on. They're a monster band, and it is, of course, UK with their debut, which I think is called UK, isn't it? UK. Well, it hasn't got a title. I don't know. Maybe it's just called UK. I don't know. Anyway, we're going off on a tangent here. UK was a super group put it, 
put together just as Prog was moving from um, the sort of outlandishness of Tales from Topic Oceans up to the concision of Duke by Genesis, The Wall by Pink Floyd and 90125 by Yes. Um, these guys would go on in, in another shape and form, or John Wetton would at least, towards Asia and find sort of FM, you know, hit parade, top of the chart stuff with something vaguely uh, inspired by progressive rock, but not necessarily pro progressive rock. In between there, we have the band UK. This is made up with of, of John Wetton on bass and vocals, Eddie Jobson, who's an incredible musician on keyboards and violin, coming out of Zappa's band at that time. We've got um, Bill Bruford on drums, probably the greatest progressive rock drummer that's ever lived. And uh, we've got um, Alan Holdsworth, possibly the greatest guitarist that's ever lived. <laughs> so this is an incredible band and they don't let up. Now, as a kid, when I bought it, I was so blown away by In the Dead of Night <laughs> that I used to just put that on all the time. More recently, I've been getting into the other tracks and it's a, there's so much going on on this album. And um, that's sweet. Of course, In the Dead of Night, it actually runs over three tracks you know that, that that make the first side up, and so really, the, and it's a sweet, and it's absolutely incredible when you take the whole thing and how it resolves. You know, when I was a kid, I never got past Alan Holdsworth's guitar solo, which is absolutely phenomenal. Holdsworth on this is another level, and uh, for a lot of progressive rock fans, Holdsworth stuff. Oh, but like, I'm sure there'll be lights slowly moving around in case. I quite like that flare in the corner. It's, it's quite proggy, isn't it? It makes me look like I'm in 2001 A Space Odyssey. I've got a new light anyway. I won't go off on a tangent yet. We'll try and get through this list, shall we? So, um, yeah, where were we? What were we talking about? UK. Um, there's incredible keyboard textures from Eddie Jobson. His violin playing's unbelievable. Uh, there's moments on this album that sound almost like Frank Zappa in their complexity and density. And then there's beautiful ballads. Everybody shines. It's, it's, it's an absolutely incredible album. And throughout it, even though it is, like Lark's Tongues in Aspic, a journey through all these different sounds, it takes you all over the place, I feel that it winds its way through this stylistic melange. And I wanted to use that word on the channel for ages. So, yeah, it moves, it, it, it weaves its way through this stylic melon, stylistic melange. Oh, I'll it up then. Um, in a way which I find absolutely beautiful. Just as you have had a dose of a certain progressive aspect, you know, some insane riffs or some odd time things or Alan Holes with solos, and suddenly we're into this sort of synth orchestral part, and then there's beautiful violin, violin playing. Um, John Wetton's melodies are incredible. His voice is so unique. Um, John Wetton was the whole package, wasn't he? You know, incredible prog bass player, an incredible singer, and an extremely good-looking, charismatic guy. And um, he deserved far more um, fame than he got, you know. But he did get a number one with Asia. Anyway, I've mentioned it on the channel, UK's debut album. Danger Money's fantastic as well. And uh, that one's just mired for me. I loved, I, there's a part of me that likes Danger Money more than this album. Now, this is all personal. This is where your personal taste comes in. Danger Money's got Terry Bozio on drums. I love Bill Bruford, but I absolutely love Terry Bozio. In the 1980s, I was obsessed by Terry Bozio. I had the two China symbols. I wanted to sound on drums like Terry Bozio. So when I got Danger Money, I was just blown away, you know. Um, and the Carino Cross track where he plays in 15, 16, that's, is that what it's called? Well... I know I've got it close. Uh, carrying the cross, carrying no cross. Um, that was so influential on me. But that album is mired a touch by the move towards that AOR sound that we're going to hear in um, uh, in Asia. For me, just in a little bit. And, and you know, what is it? Rendezvous 452 or whatever it is. It's a lovely song and I like it. But mm, I don't know. On a progressive rock album? I don't know. This is so subjective. But anyway, for me, the, the first U U UK album, I would class as a perfect album. So we're now at number seven, right? This album always gets on a prog top ten for me because I absolutely love it. And it is the third album in the Flying Teapot trilogy by Gong. I, I really love Gong. And for me, in the world of progressive rock, Gong occupy a space all of their own, right? Hawkwind also occupy a very similar space, all of your own. But I was, I've was i never been so keen on Hawkwind. You know, um, Hawkwind for me, it sounds like a good old rock and roll band 
with a kettle boiling over the top, <laughs> put through a delay, you know. You think, it's a rock and roll band, and then you've got this <laughs> boiling up in the background, you know. It's cool. I, I had Hawkwind on in the car yesterday. I've got a... I've got quite a rare album of a live gig they did, and it's fantastic, and you get swept up in it. Gong, however, have that psychedelic hippie thing going on, but they also have this virtuosity, and they have this conceptual continuity, and they have an artistry and a quirkiness that I absolutely love. The Flying Teapot Trilly is one of the great achievements of progressive rock, and it moves. It moves from, from Radio Gnome Invisible through Angel's Eggs to this triumph of music which is you and you you just put it on and it takes you on a journey all the way through from one to the other now there's some people here that might find the sort of repetitive hypnotic psychedelic hippiness of this album a little bit off-putting but for me that's what i want from progressive rock and it builds up to an absolute climax running through some incredible things that some of it sounds like almost like house music before house music existed there's quirky songs like Perfect Mystery, you know. Um, at one point, when you, if, you, if you're involved in this album, say chemically, if you were chemically involved in this album, there's one point where they put this knocking on the door and you hear the knocks on the door and you think, who's that? And, and she's going, cops at the door. It's an insane album. And then towards the end, you hear the, the whole Flying Teapot trilogy, some morphs in and spins around. It's, an inc- it's a masterpiece. You, by Gong, is a masterpiece and it is absolutely perfect. The only reason it's marked down on here is because I think it, it's, it's less progressive rock than, um, say, Romantic Warrior by... Um, Chick Corea's Return to Forever, but Romantic Warrior hasn't got any singing on. And I think that just... It's a perfect album. It's perfect. It's prog. If it had some incredible singing on it, probably the greatest progressive rock ever album ever made. But that's another another universe, that is. Um, right, so what have we got at number six? People are going to hate this. This is low on the list, right? And this is just my personal taste. But this is what you come for, isn't it? So at number six, I've got Dark Side of the Moon. It was number two on my list. When I first started to create this, I put it at number two. And that, that was a nod to the, just, the monumental achievement that Dark Side of the Moon is. Of course, it's a perfect album. It never lets up. You know, there's some people get a bit fed up with money because they've heard it so many times before. But for me, that's an incredible moment. I remember when I first heard it as a kid and I didn't know that money was this big sort of famous song. And when those cash registers came in and then that 7-8 came chiming in over the top and then that guitar solo in the middle, absolutely brilliant, right? Now, the only thing that's not perfect about this album is the new Roger Waters version that sits over, looming over it now, right? Like the antithesis, the anti-dark side of the moon, you know, the, 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 the you know, for, as, as the esoteric... Um, <sighs> Oh, I've lost it. Pretend that I, a normal YouTuber would edit this out. Um, as the esoteric occultists have said throughout history, as above, so below. And for everything that's up here, it has to be balanced in the state of karma that the world exists by the by its opposite down below. The yin and the yang, you know, the god and the devil, Right? And Dark Side of the Moon is such an incredible musical achievement that Roger Ward has had to create its antithesis with that pile of mumbly old rubbish put together on a computer. With Oh, it's just, I, I mean, why? Why? Why do it? You know, and you know it's driven by trying to put his stamp on it. You know, it, it's, it's the same thing that Jeff Lynne's done with ELO where he's gone and re-recorded all these tracks again with his with with session musicians so he could get it the way he wanted it. Nobody wants to hear it the way he wants it now. What we want to hear it is when it was made in the bloody 1970s. We've got Bev Bevan on drums and you've got Kelly Groker on bass, right? And that's the magic of the band and they're all pulling together. They're a band, right? And Jeff Lynne's perfection and wanting to control everything has actually got nothing to do with it. So I'll just move away. Move away from ELO, Andy. Move away and get back onto Pink Floyd. This is what happens to rock stars when they get old. Some of them, right? They're rich. They can do whatever they want. They can have people killed if they want. They can do whatever they want. Say what they want, you know. You know, they're like 80 years old. They've got girlfriends like 25 years old. They can do what they want. But the one thing they want to have is to live forever, right? They want to be immortal, 
and they want to be able to tell the world how great they were and put their stamp on what they think they've done. And so these old guys that used to be in a band with a whole bunch of people that when they were 20 years old, they got on with, but now they're like 80 years old. They hate them because they've had so many court wrangles and all this and they got girlfriends they didn't like. You know, all that stuff happens in a rock band. They end up 80 years old and they hate it. They can't say, I was in a great band that made a great album and it's, it was the sum of its parts, which is what Pink Floyd are, an incredible band. So he's got to try and put his stamp and go, look, that's my album. I made that album and I made The Wall. And I'm responsible for how great Pink Floyd is, right? No, you're not, mate. Sorry. And um, I have to say that Dark Side of the Moon... Right, so fantastic album. is absolutely perfect. I'm not a huge Pink Floyd fan. I like the early stuff more. But I love this album. I could put it on now and I would listen to it to beginning to end. It's so profound and moving. and it goes. It's just a fantastic album. So why have I got it so low on the list? It's because... <laughs> Honestly, Andy, just think, why have you got your low on the list? I think it's because when I was coming up as a kid, so much of this is based upon, you know, assumptions you made at like 15 years old. I like the virtuosity. <laughs> I like the virtuosity of Yes and Genesis. I like to listen to great drummers. Now, Nick Mason is a fantastic drummer. So I would, I would give my nipples away to have the sort of touch that uh, Nick Mason's got on drums. Absolutely incredible. It's just, they're just... I, I, I don't know what it is. Dark Side of the Moon is fantastic. I don't know what it is. I think it's the... I mean, people have come on here and said they're not a proper progressive rock band. And the reason is because they don't play in 15, 16 and have all tricky unison passages. And so they think that's progressive rock. I'm old enough now to know it isn't. Dark Side of the Moon might have to be higher on the list. I might have made a, made a mistake here. I'm trying to come up and I know it's just my prejudice from when I was young. But what you're seeing here... Um, in, in this is you're seeing these are the thoughts that make us decide what makes music good and what doesn't make music good and that's fundamentally what I'm interested in on this channel you're watching someone grappling with this it's a good conversation to have why have I put Dark Side of the Moon so low and it's because as much as I pretend that I don't value technical excellence and um, physical skill on, on instruments I do really don't I you know, if I didn't, I'd be listening to Neil Young, wouldn't I? Anyway, shall we move on? At number five, this is a, these are this is quite contentious. This is why I, I enjoyed doing this because when I came up with it, I thought I can't do the ten perfect prog albums because I've done the ten greatest prog. It's the same thing. I think, well, no, it's not. I could go to a band and go, what's their most important album? And it would be that album. What's their greatest album? It would be that album. And what's the most perfect album? And they're different albums. Now, there's one band. Well, there's two actually, but there's one band in progressive rock that I have trouble deciding which my favourite album is, and the, al the band is Genesis, right? Um, we're going to have to go to the Hackett Gabriel period if you progress. We're probably not going to be thinking about, you know, Duke or whatever. Um, I would argue that Trick of the Tail is pretty near perfect, but it's not perfect because it hasn't got Peter Gable singing on it, right? So that's what I mean. It's, they, they're, they're at the peak of their game when they do Trick of the Tail from a prog point of view. But uh, Gabriel's gone. So looking at the Gabriel albums, we're left with Trespass. Well, we're not going to have that because it ain't got Phil Collins and Steve Hackett on it, right? We've got Nursery Crime, my favourite album by him. You've got um, Foxtrot, brilliant album, but I just I just feel with Foxtrot, Supper's Ready is so incredible that the tracks on side one just don't quite match up to it. Selling England like by the pound, I think's overrated, right? It's a bit dull in places it's like they, it's a bit meandery and the production i've never liked the production on that lamb lies down on broadway is an absolute masterpiece but for some people it sags towards the end of that and uh, and it's not like a normal genesis album so what are we left with nursery cry and i thought uh, maybe they haven't got a perfect album so i put nursery crime on the other day it's just brilliant Right, and what I thought is tracks like Seven Stones and Harley Quinn. I thought, well, are they, they're weak. No, they're not. They're absolutely beautiful. There's a quite English beauty about Genesis, and it's never been personified better than on Nursery Crime. And then you have the darkness of Musical Box. You know, they, they are at their peak. 
this is where you know Phil Collins, Steve Cackett come in and they just inject the prog energy into that band and they are discovering this sound. It's absolutely fantastic. It's beautifully recorded. There's a beautiful, fragile, Edwardian English aesthetic across this album. And how many rock bands can capture that? It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think that album's perfect. So, I mean, uh, uh, for me, I, every little bit of it. And uh, there's three epics, and there are three of uh, Genesis Beck's epics. And, um, you know, um, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on. Uh, but uh, it's a fantastic album. It really is. Um, so what have I got at number four? Well, for me, this is one of the greatest albums ever made. It would be near the top of my charts of the greatest albums ever made if I was going on my personal taste. And the question is, is whether this is a progressive rock album. And I think uh, this is going to really put the cat amongst the pigeons with my, with the progerati out there, but not as much as what I got at number two. But uh, um, at number four, I have Led Zeppelin IV. Think about it. Led Zeppelin IV. Led Zeppelin IV is perhaps the most perfect album ever made. Right? I could put it on now, and I ain't going to switch that off till it gets to the end. And every track that comes on is going to be a development for the last, and it's going to deliver more. It takes you on an incredible journey. You know, <coughs> side one is absolutely incredible. With four of Zeppelin's greatest tunes ever. Black Dog, Rock and Roll, um, Battle of Evermore, and then Stairway to Heaven. Right? Now, is Rock and Roll prog? No, it's not. It's, it's, it's a rock and roll track. But Black Dog, that heavy, that complex riffing, that's the groundwork of progressive metal right there in 1971. And Battle of Evermore and Stairway to Heaven are not just progressive rock tracks. They're two of the greatest progressive rock tracks ever made. That run on side one is incredible. And then you flip it over to side two and it's like they they take it and they take it up another notch and it gets weirder and more profound and at right at the end of the album they return to the blues they start off almost like the rock and roll heavy metal rock and roll and they take on this journey and then they come back to the blues when the levy breaks and uh, um that is uh one of the probably the greatest example Maybe along with Since I've Been Loving You by Zeppelin, but it's a great example of a sort of white British uh, um, rock band taking on the blues and coming out with something that's profound. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. I haven't told this story on the channel. Um, I used to play with Robert Plant about 20 years ago, and I can remember going to a studio with him to do some work. It never got released. We had the incredible Benji Laverve with us, who had engineered a lot of the Zeppelin albums, and it was an incredible an incredible week, you know, trying this studio out, they brought me in and I got to have Zeppelin's engineer in, a, in, in like Robert Plant studio and we mic the drums up. And the, the funny thing is when we got there, there was no drum mics. And so um, I remember Benji going, how are we going to record this? And then he suddenly went, oh, I've got an idea. And in this studio, there was a lot of awards. Robert's won hundreds and hundreds of awards. And the Cream Awards were actually these gold-plated microphones that looked like a gun. And I remember he pointed at them and he said, they're, they are microphones. And so um, I I had my drum kit, which was a drum, the drum kit I was playing wasn't my drum kit, it was actually a drum kit that John Bonham had played, mic'd up by Robert Plant's awards. It was an incredible week. Anyway, when we were trying to find stuff and going through things, I, I found, I think, what's the master tapes to Led Zeppelin for? I found the two inch tape that it'd been mixed onto and I picked this up and opened it up and it said, you know, side one, black dog, rock and roll, um, battle of evermore, stay up to heaven. That, it had, had that there. And that's the thing when you're listening to it, that is fundamentally what you're listening to was, was what was in that box that I had in my hands. My hair just stood up on end, you know. I'm sure all this stuff is now safely tucked away in a safe somewhere. But then it was just lying around at the back of this studio. I'll move on. Right, so um, number three, I have 
Moving Pictures by Rush. That's not even a prog album. It's more like a pop album. That's when they can start being a little cincy. And they say it sounds like the police. Their best album is Hemispheres or Farewell to Kings. How can you say Moving Pictures is the best? It's not the best because it's got synthesizers. It's got drum machines on. And it doesn't have songs about wizards that go on for 20 minutes. I don't like it. I don't like it. So, um... Now I've done that, you won't need to put all that in the comments, will you? Or, although I know some of you will dress that up so it's not like that. But even if you do dress it up, just remember, when I read out your comment, I will read it out in that whiny voice. Because it does entertain me when I hear your moaning comments. Why didn't you include Pink Floyd? Pink Floyd, why is Dark Side of the Moon so low on your list? You know nothing you do. You shouldn't be allowed to do this. Okay, well, go and get your YouTube and you do it. Won't be as good as me. Right, there'll be no humour with you with that stupid voice going on about what you like and what you don't like. My favourite Genesis album is actually Trick of the Tail. Well, good for you. Forgot what I'm doing now. Moving Pictures is perfect. It's even more perfect than Led Zeppelin 4. Moving Pictures by Rush is perfect. The production's incredible. The playing is incredible. The compositions are incredible. Right, side one is basically it's like side one of Led Zeppelin four. It's Rush's four greatest tunes. Argue with me, right? You can go to about twenty one twelve, but once you get past Temple of the Syrix, that's just a load of acoustic waffle about someone sat in a cave finding a guitar. And you go, come on, get on with this. And then the end, it gets great. And side two of twenty one twelve is a bit, a bit rubbish, really. Oh, what are you saying, Farewell to Kings? I love, I love it all, but. If someone said, what's your first, what's your favourite Rush tracks, Andy? Oh, I really like Tom Sawyer, YYZ, Incredible, Red Bar, Chetta, Incredible. They, they, they get a prog science fiction story and they condense it down into almost like a pop song format. Absolutely incredible. And Limelight. What a riff. And that guitar solo by Alex Life. And he's greatest guitar solo of all time. Any questions of the nature of fame? Come on, side one is their four greatest tracks. Now, when you flip it over to side two, Light Led Zeppelin 4, they then go up a gear and you get a prog epic, but it's an intellectual grown-up prog epic, camera eye. Absolutely incredible. When I listen to that, I can see, I can, I feel like I'm a camera and I feel like I'm seeing the city scenes and I'm see, I can see it all in my mind. They paint a beautiful picture. Then they go, right, you want some prog? Witch Hunt. You can't get more prog than Witch Hunt. And uh, I found out recently, it's an interesting fact about that track, is that the mumbly, angry, um, you know, Frankenstein torch-bearing crowd that emerges in Witch Hunt, which of course is, is very relevant because there's a lot of those around at the moment. You know, you, you can't do much without ending up with a, you know, an angry group of um, torch-bearing villagers. It happens to me all the time. Every time I say something contentious on here... I can't get up the shop for um, angry torch-bearing villagers. They just bloody hound me all the time. Really do. Um, anyway, this is a silly video. It's probably because I've done too many progressive rock top tens. How many times have I talked about moving pictures? And you have to find that new bit of morsel of information. You can't say the same thing. Anyway, that, that crowd, that crowd was actually recorded um, up at Le Studio. Oh, my stool's going funny now. Hang on. I can't take this. It's wobbling around too much. I'm, I'm sat in a drum stool, you see. Oh, I'm far away from the mic. I've forgotten I've got this mic now, haven't I? Do you like my mic? Anyway, it's like a pro proper YouTuber, you see. I'm proper now. Um, prog's like, pro people like proper stuff. I'm proper now. Well, there'll be people who lament, you know... Um, they'll lament, you know, those people who think that Bleach is the best album by Nirvana. There'll be people that lament when I used to just chat to the camera and just use daylight as a light. But it's all changed now. You can see I haven't got much to say about movie pictures, but I have got one little fact. So that was recorded at the studio. And they got a crowd of people, but it was nowhere near the size of a, a, a big, you know, crowd of angry villagers. You can't just have five angry villagers. So what they did is an old trick is you set some stereo mics up and you record one group sort of here... And then you record the same group, they move over to here, and then you move over to here. When you put all of those, it sounds like a crowd in front of you. It's a wonderful thing. And if you listen closely, that little joker, Alex Lifeson, is saying all sorts of silly things. Get the headphones up and have a listen. And I love that. See, this is the thing that makes 
stuff sublime witch hunt is the darkest um most serious track on that album and yet if you get your head in there and put your head right in you can hear alex lifeson being an idiot and i love that and then vital signs comes on and it's almost like going right yeah we've come to a new chapter and this is now where we're going and vital signs as much as it's the new sound that i'm not so keen on the sound that we're going to hear develop on singles and then grace under the pressure and power windows and eventually hold your fire that line of going into the 80s i still feel that the greatest sort of post police uh, you know sort of electronica sound that uh, tune that they ever made was uh, was vital signs i absolutely love that track right we're at number two now so at number two you progress aren't gonna like it you're not gonna like it it is prog and i don't care what you say um, at number two, I have the greatest album ever made. The most monumental, the most beautifully recorded, the most incredible played, the most proggy, the most jazzy, the most fusiony, the most rocky, the most out there, the most spiritual, the most most profane, the most violent and aggressive. This is the greatest album ever made, right? And I wasn't going to put it on the list, but then I stuck it on the car the other day. I picked up my daughter and some of their friends from school and they were getting on my nerves. And I got um, Ill Communication on by the Beastie Boys, which is about the closest album I can have to something that the kids in the back will like. But it's still sort of 30 years out of their time, you know. They they probably want to listen to something new, you know, like some modern act with tattoos on their faces. But, uh, I ain't got any of that in the car. So I, And they were getting on my nerves. So I, I ejected Ill Communication by the Beastie Boys, which is an absolute masterpiece. And I put this album in. And this album is Visions of the Emerald Beyond by the Mavish Norkstra. And I put that in the car and I turned it up. And uh, one of the kids in the back of the car, when that little drone comes up with the beginning of Eternity's Breath Part 1, and then you hear all that, those sort of um, Asian drones, and it's, oh, where are we? We're in a special place. Um, my daughter said something. No, it wasn't my daughter. It was one of the kids in the car said, something quite politically incorrect and I, I i will repeat it on this channel because it is something that happened and i did tell her off for it she said oh and she went she didn't call me andy because my daughter calls me dad and now i've given it away that it was my daughter i was trying to not put the blame on her i'm not going to tell the story now but anyway she said something that was very insensitive about this album right she cast aspersions on it in a way that she shouldn't have. And I'm not going to say what it is. Because I don't want to besmirch the reputation of my daughter. In front of thousands of people. But um, she said a disparaging comment about it. That only a young person could say. Um, it was a description of it. And you can fill that in as how you like. Um, so I just turned it up. And then Narada Michael Dr Walden comes in with that drum fill. That drum fill's unbelievable. And then the riff kicks in. Bow, what the hell's this? This is like heavy metal, spiritual, Indian, insane. It's just incredible. What's doing now? Sorry, I just had a message come through on bloody WhatsApp. I thought I switched all this off. Where was I? Oh, I know where I was. Then the choir comes in. Let me fulfill thy will. Let me fulfill thy will. Lord, oh Lord, supreme, supreme. What the hell is this? Let me fulfill it sounds like you're fulfilling his will to me this is like god's come down god has come down and made an album if god made an album it would be visions of the emerald beyond is it prog of course it's bloody prog first couple of minutes you've got a choir singing to it's like <laughs> it's bloody prog it's insane and then this album doesn't let up it goes all over the place i ain't gonna tell you all about it. if you've never heard it, it's the great it, it is the best progressive rock album i had to put the obvious one at number one i'm gonna tell you now number one's close to the edge i'm not even gonna talk about close to the edge i'd rather talk about visions of the air and beyond this is something else right and at the end of the album after you've had your head completely hammered in by just unbelievable place this album goes to right john mclaughlin right 
he departs wherever he is to return back to Earth or something. You listen to the last lap track, and he really does. It sounds more like he ascends to heaven. At that point, he ascends to heaven, doesn't he? And then they replaced John McLaughlin with a new John McLaughlin that made Inner Worlds, which is a good album, but was not not Visions of the Emerald Beyond. And he he, cha- he changes it. John, John was a t- tortured genius up to that moment. I think on uh, on my way home to Earth or whatever it's called. I think on that track, he achieved whatever he was trying to achieve with that band. <laughs> it just goes to a place that no other band has ever done. This is proper progressive rock. It does your head in. It? It's unbelievable. The production's incredible. I was watch- listening to an interview with uh, Trevor Horn, you know, um, singer of the Buggles, you know, ruiner of Yes, um, saviour of Yes, and then one of the greatest producers of the 1980s with Frank Goes to Hollywood and all that stuff that he did. And he said, you know, where do you get your production ideas from? And he goes, well, there was incredible sounding albums in the 70s, like Visions of the Emerald Beyond. He said it on the radio. He said it. We all know it. This is the greatest album ever made. Visions of the Emerald Beyond is the greatest album ever made. If you go back and look at the encyclopedias of jazz, they say it's a terrible album. Two stars. Right? This is how perverted and weird the world is. Visions of the Emerald Beyond is the greatest album. It's a progressive rock album. And it's got singing on. If I could see my heart. Ah. <laughs> that sounds a little bit like that. See, this is how I get around copyright, you see. It's a, it's my new way of getting around copy. It's far more entertaining than me playing some of the track. I know some of you serious people that have got a sense of humour will be going, why can't you play some of the stuff off, stuff off the actual record so we can hear it? It would be so much better. I don't care whether his, his video gets banned and demonetised. Right now, I'm worried at the moment because I recently my videos have been getting demonetized by bloody David Lynch because I've got his hair. And so I might if I unless I get it cut, I'm going to have to get a cap because I'm not having it demonetized again. Right. I've copyright infringement against David Lynch's hair. Mr. Lynch it's not right. So and anyway, I've done number one already close to the edge by yes. Perfect. It is perfect. That's it. Close to the edge is perfect. And you and I is just sublime. Maybe yes is great at the moment. Along with Awaken. And then Siberian Kahatru, which flies, doesn't it? Burns. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about close. You want me to talk about close to the edge? Um, do you remember the art of noise in the eighties? They had a track called Close to the Edge. Do you remember? And it was all electronic and all modern and new and all that sampley and, you know, no, 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 19. It was all a bit of that, wasn't it? Remember, that's the antithesis to Close to the Edge by uh, by Yes. Now, this brings up an interesting thing. You get albums have a certain name. And then somebody comes out with a song or an album title, which is a title of another song or album. I'll give you an example. Justin Timberlake, right? He comes out with a song called Cry Me a River. But there's already a tune called Crimea River. How can he do that? Does he not know about the original Crimea River? Is he just not on his radar? Or did he like the title and he thought, I'll nick it because everyone so, who likes that is so old, they're probably dead now. I mean, what's going on with that? Um, Ed Sheeran did a tune called Autumn Leaves. How dare he? <laughs> How dare he? And I don't know whether this is an interesting video to do because it really gets on my nerves. Now, at number one, number one will be On the Corner by John Patitucci. I hate that album. I love John Patitucci. I hope he's not watching. But On on, on the Corner by John Patitucci is the nadir, the nadir of awful Fusaki, you know, bland music that came out in the, under the banner of fusion in the 1980s. It's the worst culprit of it. And uh, on the front of this album cover, and I'll put the album cover up here. And I've, d- I've discussed this before. You can go back. But I, I'm haunted by this. Is that if you were, if, if when you look at that, that's John Patitucci. And he's, he's got his designer leather jacket that he's borrowed for the photo shoot. And that's true. It says it on, inside, unless they gave it him afterwards. And he's sat on the corner. But it's not the on the corner that Miles Davis is on in the 1973 when he made On the Corner. That's a different corner, isn't it? 
This is a not that on the corner. This is a nice, respectable play. The nice lady in a berry. Is it there in the back? So I haven't even got the album. I gave mine away because that album cover haunted me. Right, and then when I came to talk about it on the video, I couldn't find it. I searched through there for ages, and then I realised, now you've given this away because you hate it. But it's etched onto my mind. That album cover is etched onto my mind. Right? That lady with the beret in the background, you know, and she's eyeing up John Patitucci. She, she, you can't, don't eye up John Patitucci. It's a happily married Christian man. Leave him alone. But look at the guy that is is doing the wind the, the, there's a guy winding up like a banner isn't there there's like a, a, a what you call it a thing that comes over the window what do you call that and he's winding it down he's the shopkeeper obviously look at his eyes he's a psycho he's a psychopath how dare john patitucci go i'm making i'm gonna make a jazz fusion album i'm gonna call it on the corner was nobody in the room there to say John, there's an album by Miles Davis called On The Corner. Who is it? John, you should know. <clears throat> you played a fusion band. You played with Chick Corea. Chick Corea played in Miles Davis group. Right, you played with Wayne Shorter. Wayne Shorter played. You remember, the Miles, you remember Miles Davis? You remember him? The, the, the guy who invented jazz fusion? In 1973, you made an album called On The Corner. It's one of the great masterpieces of jazz fusion. And it's dark and it's full of street vibes and there's pictures of pimps. It's on the, you know what the corner you're on there. That's the corner. You don't want to be on that corner, but it's an exciting corner. Yours is just a nouveau riche bourgeois corner for people who like to sit back and listen to nice jazz fusion, you know, and hopefully you can get it programmed in between the Kenny G tracks on Jazz FM or something. That's what you're after with that album. I don't care if any colour was on there. I don't care. It's so bland. The first one's okay, he did. It's, it's probably just as bad, but it hasn't got that awful cover on. Now, if you like this sort of content, I can't, I've, I've sort of did, this is like an advert of something I could do. So if you want me to go through the, these awful albums that have, and the Close to the Edge is a little bit like that, but I do like the Art of Noise. I got no, I think it was called Close to the Edit, actually, wasn't it? It's called Close to the Edit. I bet there's some hip hop group that's got, got a, um, well, of course, there is close to the edge. <laughs> Don't push me, because I'm close to the edge. Grandmaster Flash. <clears throat> There's that one as well. I'm straying into an area that's beyond my comprehension at the moment. I need to have a good think about this. Anyway, how long's this video been? 47 minutes. I'll try and keep it to three quarters an hour. Right, it's long enough to get a whole ton of adverts in, so I'll make a big a bit of money, and it's short enough to not do your head in. So it's an it's a, it's a palatable size as far as I'm. It's a progressive rock video. Come on, what do you want? Ten minutes. That's not what you get from me. Right, <clears throat> what you get is someone trying their best to get through this stupid list, whilst apparently having some sort of nervous breakdown in front of you. But I've got a new mic, and I've got a new light. And it's all good. And that, that flaring. And the cameras. I, I think to that bit of white wall. I don't like that. I like it to be. That's right. That's more like it. I like the composition. And I can't quite like that light that was coming in for me. Let's really put it in there. Get a bit of the old. Um, I can do it on the other side. Oh, no, I can't. Oh, bloody hell. Anyway, technology. I'm done. If you like this, put a like on it. Like. Press it down. Go on. Press it down. Don't not press it. Press like. Now, it's not going to hurt you. Just press, go on, press it. Go on, press it. Right, I know you've pressed it. I'm worried about him. They haven't pressed it. Just press the like button. It's not going to hurt you. Nothing's going to happen if you like it. Now, if you press the subscribe button, which is the one next to it, please press that, right? Because I like to see the subscriber numbers going up. And you think, oh, I don't know. This bloke's a bit of an idiot, really. I don't know whether I want to get him in, in my... Uh, I don't want to know what he's doing in the future. If you don't want to know what I'm doing in the future, then just go. That's fine. But if you do, then put a little, press that subscribe button. You know how YouTube works. If you want to support me in doing this, you could either become a Patreon, uh, and the link's down below, or you could su support me through the YouTube tube tip jar. Now, I'm just, I'm as poor as a church mouse, as we say in the UK. But this microphone here and this light, I'm going to show you the light because because this this is the light. I'm going to turn it around and it's going to become a psychedelic entity in a minute. Right. I don't know what will happen when I turn it around, but it will be a good ending to the video. But any patrons out there or anybody who is 
who has put a, a bit of money in my U in my PayPal tip jar. This is the stuff you've got me. This is yours. You've got like a tiny percentage of this. And do you want to see what it looks like? Look at this. We're going into the portal. The portal of Prague. It's gone dark. I will probably put some sort of psychedelic effect on this as we go off into the ether of YouTube. It wasn't that, it wasn't that impressive, really. Do you know I could change the colour on it? Look, watch this, everybody. See yellow, white, and bluey white. Is that something else? Right, look. There's, look at it. It's all psychedelic. It's great, isn't it? It's great. Oh, it's brilliant, brilliant. Is it having gear like this? I do like it. I feel like a proper YouTuber now. It's brilliant, isn't it? Look at it. I'm, I'm going to leave it on for a bit. And I'm, I might put some titles on, or, or some, I'll put something in that hole. I just wish it was more central. Hang on. That, 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 that's a bit... I don't like things not to be aesthetically... There we go. That's good, isn't it? Right. What, what happens then if I do this? If I get, get here like this, right? And I put my face here. What happens if I do this? Yeah! See you on the next video!